But before I do, let me just talk to you a little bit about why should you even listen to me. Um, so my name is uh, Roman uh, Shaposhnik. Uh, I can be reached at Apache Software Foundation on Twitter. Uh, I happen to be a senior manager at Pivotal, and I'm actually building a team of uh, SF contributors uh, to help Pivotal realize the uh, Pivotal One vision. If you're interested at all, if you're sort of participating in any of the ASF projects, uh, talk to me. You know, there is a great chance that we can find a place for you at Pivotal, and Pivotal is a really awesome place to be an Apache developer at. Uh, with that out of the way now, uh, I'm an ASF junkie. You know, I've contributed to a number of projects. You know, I'm sort of current VP of Apache Incubator. Um, I used to be root at Cloudera, so I've done a lot of things with CDH, Cloudera distribution of Hadoop, and last project at Cloudera that I worked with was Cloudera Search. So that was a project integrating sort of search capabilities into the uh, Hadoop platform. Uh, used to be, you know, boss at Yahoo, you know, one of the original sort of Hadoop team uh, guys. Uh, basically, that's me. You know, if anything on this list is interesting to you, talk to me about it. But we're not talking about me. We're talking about what this talk is all about. So. This is not this kind of a talk. I mean, typically you go to ASF talks and you get this really good introduction into a hammer and you might even get a lot of good introductions into lots of hammers, right? You know, you will find out what hammer is capable of, you know, like what the weight of the hammer is, you know, what kind of nails it can pound. And at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, well, now it's up to you, you know, use it, use it wisely. Uh, this is this kind of talk. So this is a talk where we're actually trying to build something and uh, somebody who is working at Google would look at it and say, well, it's just a toy, right? Just like you look at this thing. It's from a Flugtag uh, event, you know, where they build all these, you know, awesome machines and they just crash them into the ground. Uh, and this is what this presentation would look like for anybody working on the Google infrastructure team. But you know what? The fun of the exercise is actually trying to build it and, you know, learn something in the process. Uh, so if you're interested in how to put, you know, all sorts of bits and pieces of, you know, Apache Software Foundation projects into, you know, a coherent system that can achieve something, stick around. If you're just interested in sort of very deep dive, you know, into individual projects, no reason for you to listen to me. Uh, Mark uh, Miller had a really good presentation on solar. You know, a couple of other people had a really good presentation on certain technology. Go talk to them. With that out of the way, let's actually take a look at what is it that we're building. So for this presentation, and believe me, there will be demos, because you know, this type of a presentation is never complete without a demo. So what we're trying to build, we're essentially trying to build an original, I don't know, maybe circa 98, you know, pipeline. Uh, Google probably at the time didn't call it WWW Analytics Platform, but we might, because we're now in the world of big data and we know how things are called. But the idea was that, you know, you get this amorphous WWW cloud and you ingest it somehow, you get all the documents. Uh, you obviously have to have a tool to do that with, but we'll talk about it. Uh, but then the point of ingesting those documents is not just to sit on them, but to basically enable a couple of different things. So first of all, you have to enable indexing. You have to essentially be able to go to Google and till today, this is the primary service that Google provides. You have to enter something into a search box uh, and get a result back. And come to think of it, this fundamental bit of you know, infrastructure requires quite, you know, quite a lot of different projects to work in, in synchrony. Now, if you're interested in what our end result would look like, I can actually jump way, way, way ahead of myself and show you to right now. So this will basically look something like this. So this is what I'm building, and this is my search box. And I will walk you through the process of how to get from nothing to something and hopefully give, you know, leave enough pointers and tips in the process so that if you want to productize it, if you want to get from this toy airplane, you know, to, you know, 777, uh, you have enough information to actually find out, you know, the right people and talk to them about, but at least you would get the big picture. Uh, so, two, 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 two. this didn't. So what, what will we use, right? You know, Google obviously built a lot of this from scratch. Uh, in this presentation, I will talk about, you know, a couple of different Apache projects. But again, the whole pipeline looks like you're ingesting something, and we will be using Nudge, Apache Nudge for that. 
uh, the primary sort of store, the heart of the system, happens to be Apache HBase. Uh, it is very you know, similar to what Google proposed as a big table. Uh, but on top of HBase, we enable indexing, and we enable uh, different types of workloads uh, to provide analytics, not just indexing, but also analytics uh, with everything that comes into your system. So Google Papers on the subject kind of laid the groundwork for everything that we have today in the big data. So to some extent, you know, Google ended up being the research lab you know, for quite a few of the projects that are now part of the ISF. So Hadoop came out of the Google paper, GFS essentially, you know, is HDFS. MapReduce is, you know, MapReduce, we call it the same today. Bigtable that Google introduced in one of its papers is called HBase. Sozil, you know, the platform that Google used to analyze all of the data ingested into the Bigtable. We call similar things Pig and Hive nowadays. And kicking it up a notch, Google also introduced a much faster execution engine, you know, F1, to basically query the data on that platform. And we call these things Hawk. You know, this is the proprietary thing that Pivotal has developed, you know, based on Greenplum database, or there is an open source, you know, similar thing called Impala. So if you think about it, I mean, we essentially, in the open source, re-implemented all of the Google pipeline. <clears throat> but it all came from quite a compact set of fundamental requirements. And most of these requirements, at least initially, boiled down to storage requirements. So uh, when Google you know, just got formed as a company, it was a time when you know, the big servers from Sun Microsystems, I used to work there, I know, used to be sort of the staple of the data center, and everything had to be NFS mounted, and you had this you know, sort of single point of control, and life was good. I mean, it was good, but not really scalable. So Google basically had to come up with this low-level storage layer with the basic principle of keep it simple. So uh, it had to run on commodity hardware, it had to be massively scalable, so you had to be able to just plug the nodes into your data center and get additional storage capacity without any kind of reconfiguration or changing you know, the guts of the system. It had to be highly available, so you know, one node going down in a data center of a you know, couple thousand nodes is a pretty much daily occurrence. Uh, as, a, as, a, as an interesting data point, I, like I said, I used to work at Yahoo, and I think at some point we calculated that in a data center of 50,000 nodes, we basically get at least one ticket per day you know, for a total node replacement. So it's a pretty, pretty common thing. So you have to en engineer your layer to be able to handle that. And what Google was actually very good at, because they didn't have to sell it as a product, uh, they didn't have to convince everybody that you know, these new set of APIs that they proposed instead of POSIX APIs would actually make sense. All they had to do is to use them to build an application and convince everybody to use that application as a service. What ended up happening is that let them relax requirements along the storage file system uh, quite a bit. And that's you know, where the HDFS is coming from. Now, on the uh, application-specific storage layer, uh, something that you can actually interface with your application, well, obviously it has to have you know, some capability of leveraging the low level, uh, but it also has to provide fast you know, read and write random access, something that you know, low-level storage layer might not be able to. And it has to, be, uh, in, it has to be friendly to scan operations. Again, something that you might not necessarily get right away out of the underlying storage layer. So with these requirements in place, uh, the following design patterns sort of emerged, right? And uh, I'm talking in, about them in past tense. Again, I have no way of knowing whether Google people talked about the same thing, but we talk about them all the time. So at the end of the day, once you come up with this unified storage layer, you can call it GFS, you can call it HDFS, what ends up happening is all of your data center now becomes this huge data lake, data store, that is running that fundamental sort of low level storage layer, and all of the data, anything that you can possibly get out of any place ends up in that layer. It basically greatly simplifies the storage administration because it's kind of like the thing that lets you get away from you know, SAN versus NAS discussion. You don't really have to solve any of that because that's just the place where you dump the bits. How you leverage the bits and the application is actually something that is higher level up the stack. Uh, Stateless distributed applications 
use that layer as a persistence layer. What it means is, well, you can dump the bits by just ingesting the bits. So you can just get the bits from the internet and ingest them into your system. Or all of the applications that run within your data center can also dump the internal state into the same data store. And if they get killed, if they get you know, terminated because they happen to run on a node that was faulty, the internal state, sort of the snapshot checkpointing kind of a thing, is there. So when you reinstantiate it, you can actually start not from the beginning, but from some intermediate point. And with that in mind, it made a lot of sense to be uh, focusing on the applications, not as monolithic sort of uh, places where the state resides, but as a stateless compositions of various services. Uh, you could think about it as, well, I have this service and it can be instantiated on, on every node because I have a capability for doing that. And today you do have a capability of doing that. So Hadoop, for example, comes with Yarn, yet another resource uh, uh, negotiator layer that lets you basically give it a bunch of code and tell it, run it someplace, I don't care where, just run it. What happens then, that bit of code, that bit of code comes up and says, well, I am this type of service. I need my internal state. Well, what do you know? That internal state is actually stored in the low level sort of storage layer, so it can fetch it right in. And all the coordination is handled separately, so services do get to agree on what part of the overall job they perform, but all of the internal state comes from the HDFS. So this is the picture, essentially. Uh, I'm using Solar Cloud as an example, but you can basically talk about pretty much any application that runs on Hadoop cluster today in the same terms. So if you think about what Solar Cluster does, Solar Cluster is essentially, again, simplifying it a great deal. It's a collection of services, each one of which happened to be a solar service. Now that solar service happens to store Lucene indices that it serves up and lets you modify them in HDFS. And a lot of people say like, well, but you know, Solar used to store these things on local file system and we had this nice, you know, MMAP mechanisms, you know, and it was really performant. Now you're making me pay the price of HDFS, you know, go away. Yes, you can look at it that way, but basically if you keep using the local storage file system, you lose that capability of looking at solar as just a bunch of distributed services all leveraging the same internal state. You can maybe run, you know, 10% faster, I don't know, 10, 15% faster, but you cannot really scale that much, at least not without too much trouble. Because this intermediate layer of HDFS, what it does, it essentially abstracts away all the disks from the application, right? You know, at the end of the day, the bits have to go someplace and they end up on disks, but these disks are no longer attached to the nodes. So suppose, you know, uh, a new solar service comes up, right? So basically, the first question that it asks, and again, this could be, you could substitute HBase here, pretty much every service works that way. So the first question it asks fundamentally is, well, first of all, it notifies everybody, of, hey, I'm alive. Then the next question it asks is, you know, who am I? Tell me what is it that I need to perform, you know, for this application. And then Zookeeper is a coordination service that basically makes sure that all of the services coming up, you know, and going out all the time can coordinate in a fashion that lets them not step on each other's toes. When it comes to be really important is when a failure occurs, right? So suppose we have this picture where, you know, you see some of the disks, you know, over here, and we don't really even care what nodes they are coming from. So there's a disk that is also hooked into HDFS that is actually happen happens to be a disk on one of the nodes where the service runs as well, but the service doesn't know. The service doesn't really treat it as a local disk. HDFS makes all the efforts to short, uh, uh, short circuit the reads. So when the read happens to be on the disk that's attached to the local uh, node, the read won't go through the network. The read will be a local read, but the application could not tell a difference. So suppose now this node goes away. So this node now is no longer there. So what happens next? Well, first of all, we now have one less disk. So the node went down, you know, the disk went down. Uh, the first question to ask is what happens to the bits? Well, the good news is that the original design of GFS and you know, what HDFS followed is we're using replication to have at least you know, three by default and you, know, you can bump that number up and down, uh, copies of the same set of bits. So chances are between these three disks, 
there is sufficient copies you know, to satisfy application reads and writes. So from the bits perspective, nothing has changed. We can still satisfy uh, the application bits uh, requirements. Now, from the uh, services perspective, what happens is the zookeeper gets notified that the peer is dead, right? You know, one of the nodes got, you know, went down. And again, this talk is not to explain to you how this happens. This talk is to let you know that there is a way for making it, you know, for accomplishing that. And if you're really curious about how zookeeper is implemented, you know, catch me after the presentation and we can talk about it. But again, all that is important here is that the node went down and zookeeper knows about it. So Zookeeper basically then can say, hey, you know that's you know, still standing. Now the internal state that was specific to the node that went down, it's now up to you to serve up that internal state. You are now in charge of serving not just these Lucene indices, but these additional Lucene indices as well. Now when I'm saying that, that's actually not part of the solar yet. So that's something that at Cloudera, when I you know, was at Cloudera, we kind of like actively talked about, and I think maybe there's a few sort of Jira remaining on the backlog, but this is definitely the architecture that the project, in my opinion, should be moving towards, and that is definitely the architecture of things like HBase, you know, uh, Accumulo, like quite a few other services already follow this architecture, so I think it makes all the sense for Solar to follow in the same footsteps. So okay. Now, suppose uh, this poor you know, node that's still standing is serving up all these requests because now it's in charge of all of the Lucene indices, not just the ones that were initially assigned to it. But hey, all of a sudden, you know, our friendly DevOps team at our data center brings that node back up. So the node is up. And the same request basically goes to Zookeeper. I am alive, who am I? And what, I, what do I do? Now, Zookeeper at this point tells the service to pick up some of the slack but it may be the case that the assignment that the new node gets, the new service gets, is not quite the same as the original one, and that's just fine. So as you can see, this guy still serves up this Lucene in this, you know, for whatever reason, and that guy is just in charge of this single one. An interesting question becomes is, you know, now you have that extra disk available to you as well. So what happens to that extra disk? Again, unbeknownst to the application, the HDFS layer takes care of utilizing the bits on that disk by propagating the copies that are residing on these three so that there is always three copies someplace, right? All of this is completely orthogonal to your application design, and this layering enables the application to leverage the bits in the most efficient way. So the question is, uh, all this you know, beautiful architecture, is it you know, this thing of the future, just like I mentioned, you know, that solar doesn't quite pick up the slack? It should, but it doesn't. So am I just dreaming, or can we actually build it? We actually can, and that's the beauty of it. So here's the bill of materials. Uh, here are all of the Apache projects that you would have to use to build the system that I've just described. So the way I color-coded it is everything on this list, except the things that are like, I don't know what the color is, like reddish. These are ASF projects. So these are the projects that are part of the Apache Software Foundation family. Everything that's color coded with this special, you know, reddish color is Apache licensed. So from a licensing perspective, you have as much right to use it as, you know, any bona fide ASF project, but it doesn't happen to be an ASF project. So these projects typically reside on GitHub. They're Apache licensed, so that's good. And we would love for them to join the ASF family, but for whatever reason, they're not quite there yet. Now, if you look at this bill of material, you can actually notice that this list is pretty long, right? So suppose you, you just want to stand up the system that I showed you, right? You know, how do you do that? Well, how about this loop? I mean, this should look familiar. You know, you basically just download every single Apache project. You untar it. You then try to figure out how to build it. Because maybe it's Maven, maybe it's Ant. Maybe it needs to be past some you know, special command line options. Maybe it's make. Maybe it's something else entirely. And on top of that, oh, all of a sudden, this project that I just downloaded, let's say HBase, requires Zookeeper. How do I make sure that the dependency that HBase is getting is exactly the same Zookeeper that I will be deploying on my cluster? It's pretty tough, honestly. And that used to be the state of you know, affairs with sort of using all these projects when I was at Yahoo. So people actually, we had internal processes that were rationalizing all of that. But this is clearly not something that you want to go through. This is really, really tough. 
But wait, we've seen this before, right? You know, this picture used to be exactly the picture that we suffered with in the Linux community way back when Linus Torvalds just came up with his, you know, first kernel. Some of you may remember that email. I, I actually do. And it was pretty exciting and unusual. And I still remember the process, right? You know, the first time he posted, you know, about his kernel, I was like, yeah, I'm so excited. But then again, how do I compile it? So, well, I had my sound workstation. And I basically set up a GCC cross-compilation environment. And, you know, I compiled my kernel. And, you know, I put it on a disk and I booted it. And then I'm like, but then it doesn't even have, like, an initial process to boot. So, like, I had to compile a bunch of other things and put it on the same bootable floppy and boot from that. And I'm like, eh, and now I have bash and nothing else, and that's cool. Uh, and that was cool, but it was absolutely not usable. Uh, if we stayed at that state of affairs, I mean, today Linux would be a very boutique operating system. And one of the things that, you know, one of the projects that changed that was Debian. So Debian basically decided, okay, so we will take some of the freedom uh, of, you know, combining all these components, you know, with the Linux kernel away from you. So we will basically produce a distribution for you. And it will be an open source distribution that all of you as community members have a say in like what version of GCC gets into that distribution, what version of a Linux kernel gets into that distribution, what version of libc gets into that distribution. But once we agree, there is not really much of a uh, choice at that point, right? Maybe if you recompile different kernel, maybe it'll boot, maybe it won't, nobody knows. But as a community, we will stand behind the particular distribution and we will make sure that it works for our users. And hey, you know what, you know, Debian spawned a whole ecosystem of secondary uh, Linux distributions that basically said, well, what Debian is doing is cool, but our customers are not really DevOps. Our customers may be, you know, you sort of real people, right? You know, it's like they like nice UIs, and that's how Canonical arguably got in, into the business, right? You know, they're like, yeah, we will take everything but the UI bits from Debian, UI bits we will innovate on, but all, everything else we'll just take directly from Debian because there is no point in reinventing that wheel. Well, you know what? The good news is that we now have a project just like that within the Apache family. It's called Apache Big Top, and the idea is absolutely the same. So we're taking all of these, you know, bits and pieces of the ecosystem. We're taking the Hadoop, so Hadoop is our kernel, just like Linux is a kernel of a, any Linux distribution, and we're building a full-fledged distribution out of it. Then, nice companies like Cloudera, Pivotal, Hortonworks take the distribution and they customize it somehow to be better sort of suited for their customer use cases. But at the end of the day, there is a kernel of big top in all of these distributions. And today, Cloudera, Hortonworks, Pivotal, they all ship distributions that are based on big top. In fact, you know, by that metric, big top has won. Uh, we are essentially the de facto sort of kernel of every single commercial Linux distribution. But why am I telling you all of this? Well, because we will be using BigTop to build that sort of pipeline because I'm clearly not going through a recompilation cycle and figuring out all the dependencies. So let's go, let's get down to business. Uh, hopefully you still remember what is it that we're building. Uh, again, in the interest of time and because of a slight hiccup, I am actually emitting the whole side of things that has to do with ingestion, and besides, the network here is not really all that great. So, like, I have a pre-ingested, you know, set of uh, HTTP crawl that I will be using for the rest of the demo, and I will be focusing on the central piece of the system is basically, you know, how you build HBase, you know, on top of HDFS Zookeeper, and how you hook up, you know, Lily HBase Indexer and Solar Cloud to it. And finally, I will be showing you some nice Hue UIs. Uh, so HBase is a, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's essentially a key value store where value is sort of this multi-key uh, thing in and of itself. So basically for every key like this, and this is exactly the uh, row key design that we will be using you know, uh, for our presentation, there will be a row in HBase that essentially has what's known as column families. Now, once you create a schema for HBase, you can basically change uh, columns within a column family, but you cannot really change column, fa column families. So one of the column families that we're creating will be called content, and that will be a full representation of the HTTP web page that we got from the internet. Again, the web page is coming from this address, so this is our key. So if I have a web page at www.cnn.com slash index uh, slash a.html, I am reversing the domain name, and the reason I am doing it is because, like I said, 
HBase is really good at scans. So if we can make sure that uh, in sort of sorting order, the close links will be close to each other, we will win on scan operations, and that's exactly why I'm reversing the domain, because anything other than www.com.cnn, dot something, you know, com.cnn.ftp, right, will be close by within the range scan for the age base to be efficient. Then the content is just the content of the web page, and an interesting bit is that here we have the column family called anchor, and it's a single column family, but logically you could think of it as sort of two different columns, right? Like I'm saying, within a single column family, you can have any of the sort of, or a, a, any part you know, that follows the col column family, and you can have as many of them as you want. But they will all be called, you know, anchor sort of uh, se uh, colon, you know, something, anchor colon something. So here what we're having is essentially, we're having the, uh, the main names that linked to the uh, web page that we're indexing, and we're having the names that they use in the href tag to link to that web page. So if on the website a.com, we had a link to uh, www.cnn.com slash a.html, and that link in the href was called CNN, this is what we will be putting in our role. Uh, if on the different side, b.com, the link was actually called cnn.com, again, that bit of information will be put in here. If you look into it, this is exactly the design coming from the Google Bigtable pa uh, paper. I haven't changed anything. This is exactly the design that they came up with. Now, as a slight tangent, I mean, the reason people ask me, like, why do you want this, right? You know, it has nothing to do with indexing, but has to do everything with analysis. So how do you actually determine Come to think of it, you know, how do you think the Google image works, you know, Google image search works? Well, actually now it's pretty sophisticated, but the way it used to work was even if your picture wasn't unlabeled, they could basically get all of the links pointing to that picture and analyze what was the name of the link when it pointed to the picture. So if all of the links, you know, said horse, chances are that was the picture of the horse. If half of the links had said horse and you know, half of the links said human, like I'm not sure what Google would do, but you could get you know, an idea of this is the analysis bit. This has nothing to do with indexing. We will be focusing on this one. So with indexing, the question becomes, well, you have to design your schema. And this is an interesting point of departure for any kind of big data management software because if you listen to any big data management vendor, they will all tell you that, well, big data is so great because it's a schema on read. Uh, yeah, there's a typo on my slide, so it sh should have been schema on read. Uh, in a sense, when, when you write it, you don't actually have to come up with a schema. Like when you write it, you can just dump the bits. But when you read the bits, it's when you enforce a particular schema on those bits. So one set of bits could mean graph information to one application and, you know, row key information to a different application. So there is no inherent schema in the bits. It's only schema on read. Uh, with indexing, you kind of have to commit to a schema. Uh, there is no schema on read anymore, but the good, good news is, you know, with the design that I will be outlining, you can actually change that schema on the fly. So let's start with the simplest schema ever. And for anybody who ever used Solar, you will recognize what I'm doing here. I'm basically defining schema.xml. So the schema basically con will consist of the ID, and ID is that reverse key, you know, within the, the main name. Uh, then we will have text, which is essentially just a full representation of the text that's part of the HTML, but not HTML tags themselves. So it's not as simple as just getting the ASCII representation or UTF-8 representation of the page and, you know, kind of like indexing all of it because you actually have to get the text out of it. You know, you don't really want to index the uh, tags. And then we have the URL, you know, just for the URL that was the original URL. So a pretty, pretty simple thing. Uh, now that we settled on how our HBase, you know, uh, sort of uh, row key design will look like and how our schema design will look like, let's talk a little bit about deployment. So you have a choice if you want to retrace the steps that I'm describing you know, tonight. You have a choice of just doing it on a single node to the distributed configuration, and I will show you how to do it. 
it's fun in a way that if you have like a beefy, you know, laptop with, you know, I don't know, eight, 16 gigs of uh, RAM, you can actually do all of it, everything that I will be talking uh, here. But typically you want to actually deploy it in a data center, right, or on a bunch of, you know, virtual machines. And the good news is that the project BigTop comes with puppet-driven deployment scripts that you can use right out of the project. And we have modules for all of the Apache software, you know, like HBase, HDFS, Solar, you know, all of them. But you have to give us the topology of your cluster that you're deploying. For the rest of the presentation, I will be focusing on a single node pseudo distributed configuration where all of these demons that, I'm, that I've described, you know, all of these things that should be running on different nodes will be running on a single machine. So let's deploy the data lake, right? Uh, remember the data lake is kind of like this fundamental HDFS, you know, storage layer. And deploying it with BigTop is, you know, pretty much nothing at all. So let me actually quickly switch here. So this is the VM that I have on Amazon. Yep. So um, all you have to do is essentially say yum install, you know, Hadoop dash uh, conf pseudo, and you're done. Again, I will not do it now because it'll take a little bit of time, so it'll, uh, I, have a, I have it already pre-installed. But the good news about BigTop is that it's like having a Linux distribution, right? You know, you can just install it. You don't really have to fuss with it. It's all been pre-tested and pre-sort uh, of compiled for you. It's available on, you know, a variety of different Linux distributions. And if your favorite operating system is not supported, join our community and you will, you will experience it. Uh, Man, why does it? Hmm. Okay. Another interesting point is if you're using BigTop, no longer you have to hunt for configuration. All of the configuration is done according to the Linux file system guidelines. So all of the configuration will be in etc slash you know component name you know slash configuration. And by the way, these things happen to be alternative, so you can have different configurations on a single machine. Uh, starting and stopping the service is, again, as simple as just running the script. So, you know, off you go. Uh, as a pro tip, if you're trying to deploy something like that in your data center, use the Zookeeper ensemble size of three to five, uh, you know, nodes. Uh, but HDFS has tons of configuration, so I will not go into, you know, giving you what it should be. The good news, if you type that command, you know, uh, yum install Hadoop conf pseudo, everything just comes, you know, pre-configured for you. An additional point is that BigTop provides this very useful script, initHDFS.sh, which essentially formats the HDFS file system so that any application that's running on top of HDFS gets the file system layout that it expects. Because, you know, just like with the Unix file system, you have to, you don't really have a way of surprising an application and saying, well, no, all of my binary files are now coming from, you know, slash B instead of slash bin, right? You know, there are certain guidelines to where the applications finds its bits and pieces. But this script is essentially encoding of all of those guidelines so you don't have to hunt for them in the uh, wikis. So for what we're trying to do, we will be using HBase asynchronous indexing. And what it means is, for those of you guys familiar with HBase, HBase has a concept of write ahead log. Uh, and we essentially will be using it for indexing. Uh, it is typically used for application. So if you have a one HBase cluster and you want to guarantee for disaster recovery purposes that you can always you know, have the data back, you would typically set up a replication just like you would set up a replication for MySQL server or Postgres you know, or anything like that. And you would have a secondary HBase cluster that would be just a receiver of all the replication events. You will not actually use that secondary replication cluster for anything but you know, pushing the bits out, making sure that you always have the copy of bits somewhere. This is additional level of protection compared to HDFS. So, you know, on one hand, you could say like, well, maybe I don't need it. There are all, re you know, all sorts of reasons of why you might need it. The point is for our presentation, we will be using that mechanism, but what will be on the receiving end will be the indexing bit of it. But you do have to enable the replication in, HDF uh, in HBase. And the way you do it is, you know, again, because it's big top, everything comes, you know, from etc, HBase conf, you know, HBase site.xml. You have to essentially set this property, HBase replication to true, and you're good to go. So why is it useful to do that instead of, let's say, using HBase uh, core processors, you know, something that sits within the HBase itself and does the indexing? Well, because you can actually leverage different clouds. So if you come to think of what we're trying to deploy, we're essentially trying to have a separate HBase cloud 
we have to, then we're having the indexing cloud, and then we're having yet another solar cloud. And again, these clouds you can size up differently. They don't actually have to be tied up to each other, right? If you are not satisfied with the performance of your indexing, well, maybe you can increase the size of the cloud, or maybe the solar is the uh, culprit, right? But decoupling applications as much as possible and making it asynchronous is what's enabling us to achieve a very high throughput. When we're doing that, none of the age base uh, uh, sort of application level APIs get slowed down because unlike with core processors, we don't actually have to wait for the transaction to complete indexing before HBase can continue serve, you know, serving up the, uh, the application. All of that is being handled in an asynchronous manner, and the price you pay is that your indexing becomes not fully consistent, not sort of fully real-time, but near real-time. So it is as good as it gets, you know, given the sizes of the indexing cluster and the solar cluster, but it's not guaranteed to be fully consistent with what's currently in HBase. And again, what it means is, you know, your indexing might have documents that are no longer in HBase, which is, in my opinion, a way better option than slowing down the ingest pipeline. But your application requirements could vary, so unless you're building exactly what I'm describing here, think about it. Uh, so Lily HBase indexer, what it is, it pretends, like I said, it pretends to be a region server on the receiving end, gets records and pipes them through something that I'm really excited about called Morphline ETL. It feeds the result to Solar, and all operations are managed via individual indexers. So what is the indexer? Indexer is essentially an object that does, you know, that, that looks at certain tables and certain sort of uh, columns within these tables and does all the actual job. So in our case, the indexer that we will be creating within Lily HBase indexer uh, is called web crawl, and the way you create it is you call this command, hbase indexer add indexer, with the configuration that I will talk a little bit about you know, later on, just telling it where to find the solar in the zookeeper. So these commands are connecting it to the solar instance in the zookeeper, so it can pick up that information directly from the zookeeper and feed all of the documents to solar directly. Uh, and the configuration file is actually pretty simple. So what this configuration file for an indexer defines is that we're indexing a table called web crawl. So any replication information that pertains to a table called web crawl will be indexed by this indexer. What it means is that you can have multiple indexers, you know, all residing within that indexing cloud that will look at different tables within your HBase. So if you have one table called web crawl and a different table called, you know, my customer information, you can have totally different indexes. In fact, you can have different indexes for the same table. That's also possible. So then what we're defining here is that we're using, you know, this implementation for doing the actual ETL, and I will talk a little bit about, you know, uh, uh, that. Uh, and we're passing this uh, Morphline file as a parameter to this implementation. It's a pretty simple, you know, pretty simple definition. Now, if you think about it, what Lily HBase indexer gets is just records, right? You know, records, for, you know, pertaining to a particular table. What do you do with that record? You know, how do you index it? Well, where's the, you know, that's where the morph lines come in. So morph lines are a really cool project, and I cannot wait for them to join the Apache Software Foundation family, even though they're on GitHub and they're available, you can use them. This is the same deal that Unix got with an introduction of pipes. So this is the Unix pipes for big data. I mean, literally, I kid you not. Uh, it's part of the project kite, so if you look on GitHub, you will find it. Uh, it's, it was designed for near real-time processing, so it's pretty, pretty well optimized. Uh, you drive it through a static definition of a Hocon. Uh, Hocon stands for Human Optimized Configuration of something or other, but it's basically modified JSON. Uh, and it's a push-based data flow engine. So what I mean by it is the way it works in our case is that, is that every Lily HBase indexer has an inflow of these wall entries. Oh, that didn't come out right at all. That then get piped through the commands just like you would pipe information through the Unix you know, pipeline. And what these commands are, we extract HBase cells, we convert them to HTML, we run an X query on them, then we log just you know, to get some information. But you can basically build an arbitrary complexity of pipelines here all within the sort of morphline specification language. 
And the best thing is, MorphLine can be embedded into your application just like they embedded in the Lily uh, uh, indexer. So you know you have them embedded in Flume, you have them in, in embedded pretty much everywhere. Extract HBase cells is pretty simple. We just extract the cells. What happens here is kind of like interesting because what we're basically doing, based on the record that we're getting from the HBase cell, we're getting that record from the content and putting them into the attachment body. And attachment body is what we call you know, the thing that gets passed through the uh, command to command. So this command gets an attachment body, and this is the X query command. So it basically runs this X query you know, uh, syntax on a record that is essentially just a binary representation of HTML, and what it does, it just extracts all of the text. It, the way that morph lines are built, they are so flexible that I could have had the custom Java code in here and they wouldn't care. And a nice thing about it is, because it's a static configuration engine, uh, a static configuration file, I don't have to recompile anything. I can just change this definition and get additional functionality. So I will actually skip uh, you know, through solar cloud configuration. Uh, I will only point out that configuration that we will be using is in ETC default solar. Uh, again, you know, according to the Unix sort of guidelines, it kind of has a reason to be there. Uh, and you put all of the configuration you know, parameters in that file. Um, last thing that we need to do is we need to create a collection. And collection is something that is you know, uh, useful to the solar cloud itself. It's basically the repository of the documents. It's the thing that you know, will hold your indices. Uh, and the way that you would typically do that is through the Solar UI. But BigTalk has you know, developed this nice tool called Solar Control that lets you manipulate the internal state of the solar from the command line. So the way that we're doing it you know, for this application is essentially you know, solar init, just initializes the uh, solar control init, just initializes the state. And then you know, we create the instance dir, which is the, you know, another speak for the configuration. Uh, then we edit schema and solar config, you know, the way that I talked about. And then we create the collection. That's it. Final bit of our puzzle is Hue. So Hue is actually a very interesting Apache license, but again, not an ASF project, which has a nice flexible UI for all of the Hadoop ecosystem projects. It follows an extensible app model in a sense that if there is an application in Hadoop ecosystem that is currently missing, you can actually develop and plug it into Hue because it has a very flexible Django-based backend that's kind of like really easy to develop with. But with Hue, I could talk all day, but the picture is worth a you know, thousand words. So let me just show you what it looks like. So this is, this is what Hue looks like. It's your entire sort of console for all, everything that happens on your Hadoop cluster. So in this case, like I have data browser, so I can go look into my H base table directly. Uh, I have Zookeeper browser, right? You know, all of these things. For search, uh, let's actually try it out. So, yay. Google. So basically, I looked, again, what I ingested is the copy of the uh, Apache Big Top website, and I looked up my own last name, and lo and behold, it's basically got found in the team list.html, and just like with Google, I can even click on it. Now, you could say, oh, but Roman, it's not as nice as Google. It doesn't, like, you know, highlight as nicely. Yeah, sure, but you know what? With Hue, nothing is, nothing is really lost, because Every collection, every view of the collection can be actually customized. And again, I'm not saying that you could use Hue as a replacement for your custom-built application that interfaces solar. What I'm saying is that you can click on this helpful button and basically get into the very nice UI, letting you customize the outputs of the searches that you're doing with your collection. And that's the thought that I want to leave you with as far as what Hue is. It's the tool that gets you up and running with Hadoop ecosystem as quickly as possible. You can give it to somebody who has not experienced Hadoop at all. The guy can run it on Windows laptop, you know, I don't know, MS-DOS laptop, because Hue is just a web app, right? You know, we don't actually have to run anything on the laptop. And what I'm showing you with search, you know, how easy it is to define how the result, you know, would look like, it's kind of like what you get for the rest of the application in Hue as well. So uh, what we're doing here, we're displaying the ID, which was the you know, URL. We're truncating the web page, and we're also enabling the highlights. Uh, highlights are enabled over here. So we're highlighting you know, the information within the web page. What's also interesting is, uh, just for kicks, 
I'm also doing a little bit of you know, post-processing on the information that Hue is getting you know, for the output. So like I'm injecting this href here, so I can click on the link directly. And the sort of ease of how I can manipulate the result is actually pretty mind-boggling. Uh, and like I said, I mean, I can basically go and, you know, suppose I'm working with HBase, right? You know, I can just click on this thing, click on my table, uh, and get, you know, a dump of that's sort of unrelated to what I'm talking about, but I can look at it at least, right? So no more, you know, HBase shell or anything like that. So with that in mind, uh, given that I'm almost out of time, um, I think I sort of delivered on a promise of building a UI that looks kind of like what I suppose Google looked like, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago. Uh, we ran a demo, but this is really the architecture of the future, right? You know, what I gave to you, what I tried to sort of uh, overview, is actually an instantiation of a much more complex architecture. And that architecture is all about ingesting data from various sources into the data lake, right? You know, this fundamental repository of information that we have in our data centers today called HDFS. That repository of information is supposed to have everything. So like you can see, Flume, for example, here would be ingesting your logs. So you can build a Splunk killer pretty much as easily as I've built this demo. It will not kill Splunk at that point because obviously Splunk, you know, poured a lot of resources into making it, you know, pretty sleek, but you will get to see how, you, how it can be done, right? Uh, then uh, you ingest anything you know, through any kind of ingest points, and you know, some of them would come directly to HDFS, some of them will come to a, you know, HBase. You will index it all, and what I encourage you to think about is just like with your laptop, with Mac laptop, there is this indexer thing running all the time on my laptop, which is kind of pretty useful. I can just type stuff in, and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I can find files, and I can find my emails, and I can find stuff, right? So this architecture enables indexing on the ingest of every single bit of information that ever comes into the Hadoop cluster so that you can basically know what's there, what there is. And at the end of the day, this is exactly the architecture that will let you give your customers an ultimate service that even Google today is not capable of giving to its customers, which is, I still get frustrated by the fact that when I type a query, a full text search query into Google, and the Google comes up with, you know, five million documents, I cannot really run a pig script on that set of documents or a Hive script on that set of documents. Because at that point, it's not the free text search that I'm interested in. It's some correlation of these documents. It's something that cannot really be expressed as easily with the free text search. This architecture is fully capable of that. And with that, let me open up uh, for questions, if you guys have any, uh, or maybe not. So thank you. But yeah, seriously, I mean, if you have questions, we've got time. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Please raise your hand if you have one. Yep. Uh, sorry. Uh, reference for the slides. Oh, yes, absolutely. I will pause them on this, you know, uh, slide share. So what's the difference between morph lines and a scoop or flume? Can so you morph, integrate? Right. Both? Morph lines is a library. It's up to you where you embed that library into. So morph lines today, let me go back to this slide. Morph lines today is embedded into flume. So flume can, you know, has an access to morph line, and you can do whatever you want with that, right? So flume, if you think about it, is also based on this idea of you know, flow of messages, right? So today, you can basically configure Flume in such a way that it will use Morphline to pipe those messages through. So like I'm saying, the cool thing about Morphline is that it's not a standalone project. It's actually a library that you can embed in your applications and do really cool stuff with. It's, again, as powerful as Unix pipelines. If you look at the list of commands that Morphlines today implements, you know, it's, it's pretty mind-boggling. So using morph lines, you can pipe data into solar. You can pipe data into you know, Elasticsearch. You can transmogrify the data in all sorts of different ways. Uh, you can write your custom Java you know, snippets that don't have to be compiled in any way because morph line will take care of you know, compiling it on the fly. So it's really, really powerful. And if you have an application that is in data management, uh, consider morph lines because it might actually be a very useful engine for your own ETL. Yes. 
And again, the difference between, you know, let's say uh, stream processing and Morphline is that it was specifically designed to fit into an individual node. So anything that you can do within the individual node, you should be doing with Morphline. If your stream processing application requires scalability that will require a distributed application, Morphline may not be for you. Thank you very much. And it's time Thank to you. finish the session. If you have more questions, please ask in person uh, in the hall. Thank you.